tucked inside her beautiful farmhouse on her sprawling farm property in Wichita, Kansas, is Jessica Ramsey's cozy classroom, where she offers one-on-one tutoring to local school-aged children. A longtime teacher in the public schools who is a certified teacher, Ramsey decided to resign from the district in 2021 to become an education entrepreneur. She opened Farmhouse Phonics, which is now so successful that she's actually earning more money now as a tutor and small business owner than she was as a public school teacher. And she's also helped to mentor other teachers who want to do a similar thing. She's able to see real sustained success in helping children in her community to read and gain academic proficiency that they were previously lacking. I had the wonderful opportunity to meet Jessica recently at her beautiful home in Wichita, and I'm so delighted to have her here to share her story. Jessica Ramsey, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, well, it's great to have you here. I'm just so excited by what you've built and how you're in already inspiring other teachers to think about doing something similar. And I'm sure my listeners too will also feel similarly inspired. There's probably a lot of educators who are in a conventional school system, maybe feeling a little bit frustrated or itching for a new challenge or a new opportunity. And you're a perfect example of what something could look like that's successful and that uh, kind of is true to your own strengths and unique abilities as an educator. So great to hear your story. But I want to start back with kind of what made you decide to go into teaching and education from the beginning? You know, I always, I actually was very lucky to always know what I wanted to be. Um, I knew I wanted to be a teacher very early on. I loved school. I loved going to school and learning and, and then coming home with my, uh, I have five siblings. So then we would all play school and I always wanted to be the teacher. So I knew right away that was my, that was my pathway that I was going to follow. Um, I, my mom always wanted to become a teacher, but Um, instead was a stay-at-home mom, so a teacher in her own way, and encouraged me. And so I just thought, why not? So I ended up going to school to be a teacher and loved every minute of it, almost. Towards the end, it got a little dicey, but yeah, I loved it. Yeah, so then after, uh, after college, what was your kind of teaching experience like over the past several years? So after college, I graduated from a local school here in Wichita Newman University, um, and then I ended up going to a job fair there and got hired at um, one of the parochial schools here in town and worked there, learned so much about what managing a classroom was and meeting the needs of 20 little kiddos was and learned a lot, grew a lot, Um, became a mom times three during that time when I was working there. And when it became time for my own kids to go to school, we needed to make some changes. So I moved into the public school system here in in the Wichita area and learned even more there. Like the resources that I was provided with and the trainings and the professional development was so impressive. And I couldn't stop, you know, learning. I loved it, loved it, loved it. So you were mostly teaching elementary age students, and that must have been when you really started seeing some of the challenges with some students in learning to read and literacy. And tell us about how that interest in kind of early reading, early literacy um, came to be for you. Well, I, my first teaching job was in first grade and we were um, extremely phonics based school and the kids left first grade reading. It was just kind of a really great foundation for them. So then I went up to second grade and at that school I was at, second grade seemed to be a class full of readers as well. When I switched schools, I was third grade teacher and was kind of shocked about how I would notice not all kids had strong foundation of reading. And that concerned me them being in third grade. Um, You know, they say the transition from reading to learn to learning or from learning to read to reading to learn kind of happens with third and fourth. And so being from a a phonics background, I became really interested in teaching those kids the phonics they needed to be able to go on to fourth grade and feel successful. So I've just always been a huge proponent of phonics because it makes, you've got to have that decoding before you can put together, you know, 
the language and then the comprehension. I, I just was always very adamant that that needed to be done. And um, I just kept seeing it. So then I went back down where my heart was in first grade because that's where I get to teach most of the phonics. And I just, knowing how I had been up in second grade and then third grade made me, I think, a better teacher in first grade because I knew where they where they needed to be. Yeah. And, and so you make a really good point that in conventional classrooms, the curriculum often shifts in third or fourth grade. And so if you're not a proficient reader at that point, it can become really difficult to catch up and to, to keep up going forward. And so you really kind of saw that gap and, and saw how that could set children back uh, as they proceed along their schooling. So then what started to happen? I guess, when did it start to occur to you that maybe you should go off on your own and start really helping? helping kids with one-on-one reading tutoring instead of just focusing on your role as a classroom teacher? Well, it started um, in my building. There was a reading interventionist opening and I wanted to do that so desperately. I wanted that very badly. I, that's what I always wanted to do was sit at a small table and pull readers back and just teach them their skills, whatever they may be, whatever grade level, just find where they were and teach them so that they could, you know, succeed, Um, which I did a little bit in the classroom, of course, but when you're managing all of that, it it gets difficult. So I really wanted to be an interventionist. So I went to my boss and said, you know, I'm really interested in this position. And that's when he let me know that since I I don't have the correct degree. Um, So I was forced with kind of a decision. I guess I could have gone back to school, but who's to say that job would be, it wasn't going to be open or another job would be open. And I just kind of, it broke me a little bit. I, I considered myself to be a reading specialist. I'd done it for 18 years. I think it was 16 at the time. I taught kids how to read for 16 years. And I, I'm very up to date on the research and I thought, and I utilize all the trainings I can go to. So I, I was a little broken. So that kind of got, um, me thinking that I I could do it without a degree. I just had to figure out how. That's when um, COVID and online school and a lot of Zoom classrooms, and I was teaching first grade on Zoom, and it was difficult to say the least. My kids did great, but it was just, it's just not the best learning environment for six and seven-year-old kids. So towards the end of when COVID started to slow down and the, you know, we got a little bit more able to be out and about. We had masks in school. We got to go back to school. Former um, students of mine and parents had reached out to me and said, you know, we really kind of lost some, some skills over COVID. Would you be able to, you know, work with my kiddo privately? And I was like, most definitely, sure. So I started just with one child working with her, um, just trying to get her, you know, um, caught up, if you will, not necessarily caught up, but, you know, strengthened the skills that she had. And then that kind of became another kiddo that whose parents kind of heard of it and they really enjoyed that idea. So I decided I was going to do, I was going to do this and I was going to do it after school. So right before um, conferences, I created a cute little brochure with my credentials and just kind of an idea of what I did. And I handed them out to my colleagues and said, hey, you know, if you are in a conference and they need some more phonics time or something here, you know, give them this. And that blew up. (laughs) It got to where I was having, I would teach school during the day in my classroom and then rush home and teach, I, I would have a child at like a 420 appointment and a 530 appointment and then a 630 appointment, sometimes a 730 appointment. And so I, I was really getting, it was really picking up and, and catching on. So then um, I did it over the summers too. My summers were back-to-back kids. I had 22 kids at one point that I, I can do this. I'm going to do this. So I, didn't listen to any of the people that thought I was nuts. And I resigned my teaching position and finished out the year, obviously, and then have been full speed ahead ever since. Just incredible. I mean, I think it's amazing kind of going back to, to the, 
the point where you decided to really make this shift was you wanted to stay in the district and get this, what you thought at the time, this sort of dream job as a reading specialist to really go deep with students um, on literacy skills in the district. And yet, even though you are a certified teacher, you've been teaching for over a decade and a half, your undergraduate degree is in education, uh, you were then not able to get that position because you didn't have the master's degree as a reading specialist. So just that sort of that one final hoop that you didn't run through ended up making it impossible for you to have that role, even though, of course, you were incredibly qualified for it. And so so that sort of rigidity was ultimately what enabled you to say, hey, all right, well, I'm going to go do this in my own way you experienced, you know, COVID and sort of the setback that that created for families and then families gravitate toward you to help to help their kids with literacy and learning. And from then you're off to the races. So you resign your, your teaching job and decide to open Farmhouse Phonics full-time in this, again, cozy little space in your farmhouse. Um, you know, maybe you can describe a little bit about the room. You know, it has uh, sort of little chairs on the floor when you're doing <laughs> um, some hands-on activities with the kids. It has this really sort of welcoming, non-intimidating feel. Your uh, wonderful dog, Blue, is often uh, in the room with the kids. It kind of takes the pressure off. Um, but tell us kind of what you were trying to create with this tutoring space. What kind of atmosphere? So first, uh, my husband and I um, found this farmhouse. It was built in 1919. And we fell madly in love with this idea that we could fix it up. Um, looking back, we now kind of think we were a little nuts because it's been a giant project, but we love it. Um, but it wasn't quite big enough. So we added on to the house and from the house, we added on a garage and then a walk space kind of in between the garage and the home. And I, as the construction was going on for that, I thought this would be perfect for my own little classroom. So I convinced my family to let me have that space and it is very cozy. My favorite part about it is that it is not in my home. It is not sitting at my dining room table. It's completely closed off from, from my house um, so that my family feels like they can still walk around and be free in their space. But my class or my kids, that it, it has its separate entrance um, right off the back. And it's more, I think, professional in a homey, cozy sort of way. Um, yeah, we sit on the floor. I love to sit on the floor, even though Blue, actually Blue prefers we sit on the floor. She is was a rescue that we rescued and adopted and has been key in making kids feel comfortable with her. Um, she reads or she listens to them read. She brings them her toys. The first thing that kids do is give her a treat. I mean, that's, she kind of, she knows her tricks. So that's really welcoming, I think with Blue. But yeah, it's cozy. We sit on the floor with my older kids. We sit up on little bar stools, but I've got cabinets of cabinets of manipulatives and, and, just resource, research-based resources that I just can organize and put together to make it a lesson that is specifically for the success of, those, of each kid. So it's just been incredible. Yeah, I love that observation that one of the things that you really like about, about your classroom is that it is separate from your home. And I think that's another sort of interesting tip for any educators and entrepreneurs who are listening to think about what they want to create. Often the easiest thing to do is to start something out, out of your kitchen or out of your living room. And there may be some benefits to that, but, but having a little bit of that space, at least down the road, could uh, make it more sustainable, make it feel um, less intrusive, less overwhelming. Um, in, in sort of separating family from the work environment that you have. I think that's a really great point. Uh, and so, you know, what, what is your, what is your secret success? Sort of what, it, what, what is it about your approach to teaching literacy um, that is so impactful? I mean, you've said that you have yet to have a failure, right? That you <laughs> sort of have this 100% track record. You have more and more families coming to you um, more than you can even accommodate in terms of hours in the day and the week. So what is it about your approach that you think is so successful? You know, I think I'm very strong with 
I'm a strong believer that phonemic awareness is so, so important. And not all of the phonological awareness is so important. Um, we also have, you know, we have to have that as our, our foundation. So the first thing I always do when I meet with a new kiddo is I assess their phonemic, their phonological awareness first thing. And then from there, I make it, you know, I work on that to build up those skills. And then I assess them with phonics as well. And I find where they are. Doesn't matter to me what grade they're in. I think that's the thing is I don't teach um, grades. I teach kids how to read, whether that's a five-year-old or a 13-year-old. And I have kids all the way from five to 14, actually, right now, um, that just struggle in different ways. And so the goal is to find where they struggle, what skill set that they still need, what phonological concepts they don't have, um, what phonic sounds they don't have, start there. And I don't typically move on until it's mastered. Every single session that I have with my kids, we start out with phonemic awareness um, and with sound symbol review every time. So if I'm going through my sound symbol review cards and you struggle with OI sound, I don't stop or I will finish up and then OI sound goes over to the side and we will talk about OI sound and the words and then you know, we'll map it, we'll read it, we'll spell it. And if we have to do that every session for six months, then we do. I don't move on until those are embedded and orthographically mapped. And so you leave here with more and more mapped and it's never forgotten until you are. I think that's so important. The thing is, is older elementary kids, they don't get as much phonics in class. And part of phonics is reviewing each sound each lesson and then adding something new and then adding that to the review pile. It's until your review pile is huge and your maps, your orthographic mapping is huge. And I can do that here. I don't have, a, I don't have 20 other kids to tell me, you know, I don't have to manage behaviors. I don't have to manage um, any other kid, but just that particular student in front of me. And I do it for about an hour, just me and them. And I don't, you know, I don't move on until I feel like that kiddo has it. And then we just go from there. Yeah. One of the interesting points you made during uh, our visit was that when you have your older kids who might be in fifth or sixth grade, not reading proficiently, the teachers themselves aren't trained necessarily in reading and early literacy training. Um, and, and so there isn't really a path forward for a lot of those kids in the conventional classroom to gain that proficiency? You know, what did you see both as a teacher in the system in sort of the upper elementary grades, as well as what are you seeing with some of your older students who are in your tutoring program? See, and I think with that in elementary, um, we learn to read and those teachers are, are that's what we teach in, in phonics and spelling and all of those things you teach it. But as kids get older, I know in the, in the district I previously worked at about fourth grade, no longer, there's no more spelling lists. Um, and then we go into a lot of morphology of words and those teachers are experts at that, but by no fault of their own, they don't have a strong phonics background because they're upper elementary kids. And ideally upper elementary kids would have a strong, would come to them with a strong phonics background. So yeah, I find that's a lot of what I do is help bridge that gap between reading to learn and, or learning to read and, and reading to learn. If you can't decode, then words aren't going to sound right or make sense. I mean, it, and for my older kids, we we go through decoding and encoding, and then we go into morphology, and we do go into um, the syllable types. Syllable types are so, so important for getting kids to read those longer words, and, and I've had great success explaining that longer words are really just a series of smaller chunks, and once words can be broken down, it's easier. I think the most important thing I see, though, is when I teach that, the confidence that I, that these kids have then have. It's silly or embarrassing or sad to be a struggling reader in a group of peers that aren't. And if I can help after school or during the summer, um, I think that makes the confidence in school easier, their confidence raises, their grades raise, they're happier kids. It's, it's a win-win. 
But gosh, it must make you think about all the kids that you're not able to reach, right? I mean, not just in the Wichita area, but then, you know, you think about all of these kids struggling uh, across the country and just many of them get lost in the shuffle. They never really become proficient readers because there aren't those supports for them as they move along um, through elementary school and secondary school. And you're doing the best you can. You are a uh, <laughs> completely uh, packed schedule during the afternoons and into the evenings. You also have some students who will get pulled out from the school day to come to your program during the school day to, to help you uh, have you work with them at that time. So you are are busy. And, and yeah. I wonder, kind of thinking back when you made that leap into your own business uh, and now seeing what a success it is that you're actually earning more now running this tutoring company than you were as a public school teacher. You know, what is your your sense upon reflection? I'm, I can't, I look back and think, I can't believe I did this. And I, I can't believe that it wasn't that difficult. Um, I wish I had more help and I could clone myself, but I feel like I'm doing right by the community. I also have, I support homeschool families too. So um, for those families that are having any struggles phonemically or any phonic struggles, or sometimes in, in numeracy too, I do numeracy as well. I've also been helpful to them because then they can come during the day. So that helps my appointments go, you know, I send them during the day and some during the evening. I think the, honestly, the, the big thing that was holding me back from doing this as a classroom teacher was I was nervous about getting insurance. Um, I was nervous about not being at the school district that my kids go to, because I had always, always done that. Um, and I was nervous about, making sure, you know, that I could provide for my family financially. It, it, there's just so many factors that went into it. And then looking back, I think I'm so glad I did it. And, and I wish I could convince a lot of my teacher friends to do it as well, but I know they're needed in the classroom and, and, you know, with the teachers, there, there aren't a whole lot of teachers right now. And so I hate to pull them, but I really would love to pull some of my best teacher friends and say, Hey, you can do this too. It's it's not impossible. And you are inspiring some other uh, educators to follow in your footsteps, right? You are mentoring some teachers who want to do a, a similar path. What mm -hmm. has that been like? What are they encountering in, as classroom teachers and what are they looking to you for in terms of uh, help and assistance? So I've actually mentored two different individuals um, that have just reached out to me via social media and said, hey, how did you do this? How can I do this? I want to do this. And, you know, just giving my advice. And, okay, this is what I would do. And this is how I got my name out. And this is how I got my word out. It's for health and reputation. But this both of my mentor are running businesses and it's kind of fun. We have our little, well, if I don't, if I don't have an opening and I can't get you in on Thursdays, here's two other names that you can go to, which has really been helpful. That way I like to have, you know, when someone asks me for help and I can't help you, I like to provide someone or something that can. Um, so that's been kind of great, but they've had wild success as well. Um, it's just, it's just been a really very cool experience. And I kind of feel like I have a little team of teachers where we can share ideas and we all follow each other on social media. And so, you know, we'll get a message and be like, oh, I loved that game. I'm going to copy that. Or is that cool? Or how'd you do this? And it's kind of like my own little staff of friends and colleagues. So if someone is listening and, and wants to do something like this, they, they want to uh, open up some kind of tutoring company or a micro school or leave the conventional classroom to become an entrepreneur, what do you suggest they think about first? I think um, the first thing would be how, where, where, where they would teach and where you would have the meeting with the kid. I did actually used to tutor out of my classroom in the summer. My boss was okay. Or let me do that. And we just meet up at the school. I know locally, the library, lots of public libraries are a great place to meet up. Um, I even have a friend that would tutor it in the back of a Starbucks. You know, they have the, the get a coffee and a hot chocolate and some games and 
wherever is a comfortable, quiet space is the best, the best thing. And then just make sure that you're doing some good quality assessments at the beginning so that you know exactly where to start and where to go. Another piece of advice that has been so helpful for me is when I meet with a new student, I ask the parents to email myself and that classroom teacher. So an open line, an open a line of communication between all of us. And that's been really helpful. I'll have classroom teachers say, hey, you know, if would you be able to work on this particular phonics pattern, this is what we're doing next week. And I can give some you know, pre planning to where I'm teaching and then we'll, we'll spend our time on the, you know, the CDCE if that's the pattern that, that they wanna work on that week. Another thing that I really enjoy is when I have my kids, when they come to me, they bring their backpacks. So whatever's in their folder, you know, I'll look through. And if the CBCE pattern was taught and assessed, a lot of times teachers can't keep going back if you didn't get that skill. They got to move, they have to move on to the next, the next skill in the scope and sequence. So if the spelling test has some errors on it, then we'll just pick right up and work on those errors. And I have that opportunity to keep working with that kiddo, even though maybe the classroom teacher can't. Um, and so that's been really helpful, working hand in hand with parents working hand in hand with classroom teachers, work with reading interventionists, all of those were a team. And the goal is to help the child succeed. And it's, it's really helpful, I think, in all areas. Yeah, such great advice for kind of getting started, thinking about where to start, even thinking about local public community spaces that could be mm -hmm. a, a good launching point and then get to the point where you are, hopefully, where you have sort of this established, dedicated space. Um, but I wonder now, as you're sort of a veteran in this, uh, even just a, a year or two in, what are you thinking about in terms of your future goals, scalability, growth, and so on? Oh, you know, my husband keeps teasing me that we need to build me my own schoolhouse um, out back on our property. I think that that would be fun. Um, I would love to be able to have another couple of teachers with me uh, to be able to, you know, help so that we could meet the needs of more kids. I'm just one person, so I wish I could, I'd love to be able to help more kids. Um, I really would love the idea of maybe working, I have a very my very good friend is a school psychologist, and we talk a lot about how we could work together to meet needs of more kids as well. So I'd love, I'd love to expand. I'd like to, I think I'd like to be able to hold, help more kids in a, in, in a smaller amount of time because you know I'm, there's just one me, and I have a waiting list of six. And I, you know, I hate telling people no because usually if you're reaching out to me, it's because your kiddo needs that extra assistance that they can't get at school for whatever reason. So I'm hoping that I can expand and help more kids. Oh, I love that your growth strategy is also really focused around collaboration, that you can work with other specialists and experts in the area, again, just to achieve the larger goal of serving more students. Uh, and one of the things that I really noticed from my time in Wichita was really a collaborative atmosphere, particularly among uh, education entrepreneurs like you, micro school founders, people who are running learning pods and homeschool collaboratives and low cost private schools in the area. And there seems to be quite a burst of those options and not only sort of accelerated over the past couple of years, but the seeds of which in many cases were planted before that. Um, you know, there's, there's even other another tutoring center that started in the Wichita area pre-2020 that's now kind of evolved into a, an established micro school network. Uh, we'll have Pam McEwen on the podcast soon to talk about that. So there is this sort of uh, energy around uh, education entrepreneurship, schooling alternatives, more personalized learning options options in the Wichita area. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to that as sort of what is driving that demand for these options and what do you think is helping to catalyze the supply of those options with education entrepreneurs like you? I think that, um, honestly, I think uh, the pandemic changed a lot of schooling and the way parents and educators see schooling. I think the view is different. Um, I think when parents were sitting at home with their kids on Zoom trying to help them, they realized that this is a giant, this is a giant job. And then I think also some parents thought, I really enjoy this time I'm having with my child. I, I like seeing what they're learning. I like help facilitating that. I think I can do that. 
So I appreciate a lot of those micro schoolings because it's a lot of um, moms and dads that are able to not only teach their kids, but open their doors to other kids. I love that opportunity that kids are having now. I also think the the Vela the Vela um, organization has been incredible in helping me. I wrote a grant. There's this Vela V E L A organization that has really just sat behind all of us educational edu- educators and pushed us and said, "Here you go. You can do it." Um, the grant writing process that I got, I received from there to get materials and start this. I, I don't know if I could have done it without Bella. I just filled out the very easy grant paperwork and crossed my fingers for several months and, and then was awarded um, $2,500, which was great. I could go and get what I needed um, and start what I needed to do. And so now it's just been, if you follow them on any social media, you just see um, story after story after story after success story of people starting these businesses and the support they're giving. I think it's an incredible amount of, it's just incredible and super helpful. Yeah. The Vela uh, education fund really offering these micro grants to non-traditional uh, educators, schooling oh. alternatives, homeschooling collaboratives. They can be faith-based. They can be secular. Um, they're really sort of agnostic when it comes to the kind of program that you're developing, just making sure that, that you're uh, an entrepreneur looking to, you know, solve a problem for your community and often do so in a sort of non-traditional way. Um, and I think you're right that that's not only financially helpful for, um, those of you who are new founders, but also by providing that community that you're able to connect with others uh, in your local area who may be receiving these Vela grants. And uh, it just started a couple of years ago that Vela issued these micro grants. Now they've issued um, more than 1800 across the country. So, you know, really exciting to see the growth of that and how that is help- helping, I think, to accelerate and catalyze more of these uh, entrepreneurial options for families. So, you know, I'm just curious, Jessica, as you think about you know, your experience as an educator in conventional schools uh, for so many years, and now going off and doing your own thing, but still sort of working peripheral to the conventional system. You know, what do you see as the future of education, say, over the next five to 10 years? I think a lot of families are doing their own research. I think we used to, or, you know, in the past, you sent your child to school from, you know, eight to four, you studied the spelling words and, and you went to parent teacher conferences and that was as involved as a lot of the working parents could get. I think now kids are, are struggling in different ways, um, whether or not developmental or if they had a, a, a couple of years of COVID that just didn't help them academically. Parents are kind of taking things into their own hands. And I love that. They're reading more, they're researching more. Um, social media is so helpful when it comes to it, the science of reading. So many things I learn from just different educators that are, you know, researching the science of reading. It's, it's a rabbit hole. You can go down of, you know, the best practices for how kids learn how to read. And the more we know as parents, the more we are able to help our own kids. So I think I think we're going to see a a burst of micro schools and homeschooling and parents kind of taking things into their own hands because there's more help. There's, there's easy access to research. Another couple of things I've done, if I can't get a, a, an opening for a child to come to see me just for whatever reason, if I don't have an opening, um, I'll just talk back and forth with the parent. But what's the struggle? Okay, we're struggling with these sounds and spelling. Um, here are some rules. This is when we use this word, or you know, this is when we use oh um, D G E versus G E. Lots of parents don't know that rule when the vowel says its name or when the vowel doesn't say its name. And so I can kind of provide those tips just via email or via text message, and then that encourages parents to kind of look around and be like. Oh, I didn't know that. If I did know that, I could help more. Where can I find that information? So I will send them tips or links or books. And and the more they feel confident, yeah, I can do this. I can help my kiddo with this. I just need that information. So it's actually impressive to see all of the involvement that, you know, 
grandparents and uncles and aunts and parents are are having with these kids is education. It's really reassuring. Yeah. So parents, families really activated, more empowered to um, take a larger role in their children's education. I think that's been certainly accelerated over the past couple of years. And then education entrepreneurs like you are recognizing that parent demand for something different and are going ahead and building solutions that really meet their needs. It's exciting to see. So Jessica, if my listeners want to connect with you to find out more about Farmhouse Phonics, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, Farmhouse Phonics has a book page um, that I post lots of, I post um, things that I do with my kids. So I, I have lots of teacher followers that are like, great idea. I'm going to try this with my class. So I try to post some, some cool things that way. Um, my email address is farmhousephonics at gmail.com. And it's just F-A-R-M-H-O-U-S-P-H-O-N-I-C-S at gmail.com. Great. So people can follow you on social media. They can connect with you over email. Um, Hopefully you'll be getting some more inquiries from uh, teachers who are interested in, in again, doing what you did, seeing the success that you've had of leaving the classroom and building a successful tutoring company that's having a huge impact in your community. Hopefully you'll be able to expand and have an even greater impact uh, with additional teachers and additional resources. So All the best to you, Jessica, at Farmhouse Phonics. Thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate it. Thank you.